Hey everybody, thanks for joining. Um, we should be getting started here in just a moment. Um, can't hear me, just let, just let me know, but we'll be on in uh, just a minute. I'm actually gonna get up and just close the door. We don't get any sound. James should be with us here in, uh, in just a minute. Kevin, can you hear me? I think that is a yes. All right, we'll give everyone just another couple of minutes. I think we're waiting for James to come on.
give everyone just a couple more minutes to kind of filter in. And then we'll um, we'll get started. Uh, James is actually taking care of a customer, so he's gonna he'll be on uh, in just a minute. He's got a day job; he's still got to do. I think a lot of people here are getting ready to check out for the weekend. Uh, we appreciate everyone uh, joining us on this Good Friday. Um, I imagine a lot of people are either the week is over or is going to be over shortly, um, and uh, we we're really glad to have you. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about brewery pumps. Uh, as the invitation said, uh, James Moriarty uh, is going to be joining me at some point here. He's the owner and operator of Urban Renewal Brewing. They're in um, the Ravenswood neighborhood of Chicago. Uh, we have uh, four or five of James's beers that at the end we're going to do. Oh, James, hey, James, how you doing? Hey. Uh, yeah. You're live, man. So... Don't say anything too reckless. Uh, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is James Moyarty. Uh, I'm uh, the co-founder and brewer at Urban Renewal Brewery. Um, worked with uh, Andy over at Holland for the last, I don't know, three, three and a half years. Oh, uh, it's longer than that, man. I think it's five, closer to five. Oh shoot! I guess it is. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah, that was quick. Um, yeah, I used to work for Alpha Brewing Operations, uh, which is a uh, an equipment supplier based out of Lincoln, Nebraska, and partnered up with Holland Applied um, for supplying all of our pump needs. Yep. Um, so James, I was just telling everybody who's who's in attendance, we're gonna. Uh, first of all, I'm ha I am having a hazy river uh, right now. It's it's very good. Uh, I uh, I couldn't get any packy. The liquor store was out, but uh, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> it's in short supply. I do have a keg of it in my basement, and uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna go through the presentation today. We'll just talk a little bit about craft beer pump, what people are using, get some of your feedback. We'll bring in some of the guys for a taste test and a review, and then uh, also some commonly asked questions. So if anyone has any craft beer, craft brewing questions that, that they want to um, throw out there, please feel free at any time. I, I do have the Q&A open. Stop me and we'll, we'll talk about it. But um, we do appreciate everyone taking some time this afternoon to, to join us. So when we talk about pumps, the brewery pumps specifically, um, what we're really talking about is, is sanitary pumps. And, and to kind of get an overview of what makes a really good beer pump, we need to talk about what makes the pump sanitary. A sanitary pump is, is a pump that's going to be cleanable and drainable. You want all stainless steel components, FDA or USP Class 6 elastomers, and then most will have a surface finish that's kind of industry specific. In the craft beer world, we're typically in the 32 RA range, right around where we are with some of the food grade products. In a, in a pharmaceutical application, we're going to be in the 20, 15, 20 RA range. Um, and then we also look at different seal configurations depending on specifically in the craft brewer industry. I think James, that's something that we see a lot of issues with. We're always helping people troubleshoot their mechanical seals for a few different reasons. We'll, we'll talk a lot more about that. Um, why do we want to use sanitary pumps? Why do we want to use pumps that are cleanable and drainable? Um, first and foremost, it's product integrity. We don't want to impart any unwanted smells or tastes. James, I think, I'm not sure if you saw it, but there is a very popular craft brewery in uh, the greater Chicagoland area, who recently had to announce a recall of some, uh, of actually of a barrel-aged product because it was contaminated. Did you hear about that? I did, I did. So what, how do you contaminate a beer? What, what happens when something like this goes wrong? When people talk about product integrity and quality control, what does that mean to a brewer? Uh, well, um, the, the big thing is, is true isolation. Um, so if you're, uh, cleaning a tank, you want to make sure that, um, after, after your cleaning process, um, any remnants of product that was 
uh, within that tank beforehand is not going to be transferred to another batch. Um, this is particularly important when you're uh, dealing with like mixed cultures, uh, like wild yeast and bacteria. Um, you do, I mean, that's, that's the quickest way to get a systemic issue. Um, so you want to make sure that um, you know, your pump is providing adequate flow um, so you get your velocity, um, which is going to be your abrasion uh, force on, on the surfaces, um, as well as just ensuring that you have uh, the correct concentration of your chemicals within, your, um, within the uh, defined temperature parameters. And um, uh, I mean, it, it really only takes one yeast cell to really cause an issue because um, that yeast cell is going to multiply. So you just want to make sure that every surface is being properly cleaned. Uh, you can't sanitize the surface that's not cleaned. Um, so that's step one. Um, and then you just want to make sure that every surface has been adequately um, covered. And, uh, you know, so if you have a, a you know, kind of a, a common issue with mechanical pumps, uh, like ex external seals, is if you have any sort of uh, uh, leak, um, you know, especially if it's, you know, well, it's an external leak, um, that, that's going to allow product to build up on the outside of your back plate. And eventually that, uh, that buildup is going to mold um, and just cause you uh, a lot of headache. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Just, so you, gotta keep, you gotta keep the pumps clean. You can't social distance beer, right? It's, uh, you, you only got, you only got one brewery and so, you know, one brew house and so many tanks most of the time. So, um, it, it's, a, it's really important from product integrity standpoint that we keep everything, everything clean. Obviously, product safety, these are things people are drinking. Uh, the, the, fortunately, and I think in most cases, James, correct me if I'm wrong. The situation where um, so yeah our um so we have a single um, CIP slash transfer pump um, that is that's really our workhorse uh, within the brewery. So this mm -hmm. this one pump is handling all of our cleanings, all of our our beer transfers, sending product to um, to our canning line. Um, you know it's. Uh, It's the workhorse. I, th I think I think we might have lost James there, which is which is okay. Um, uh, the the brewery I was uh, referring to that uh, had the bad batch. Um, they um, uh, fortunately there was no human issue. It just the taste profile wasn't desirable. So so nobody was harmed in the making of that beer, but they did have to recall a bunch of it. And then we also think about product consistency. We want uh, a urban renewal, lazy river, a happy blonde that tastes the same every single time. We want Miller Lite to taste the same every single time. Bud Light tastes the same every single time. That's why we need to think about cleaning pumps and, uh, and, and best cleaning practices. Um, when we look at sanitary pumps, we have two different kinds, two primary uh, kinds of pumps. Uh, we have positive displacement pumps and centrifugal pumps. And we'll spend some time, uh, James back. Uh, he had the, I think, he, I think he's got a customer. He's working in the tap room by himself. Um, but uh, when we look at positive displacement type pumps, our common PD pumps are going to be rotary load, twin screw, air operated double diaphragm, progressive cavity, and, uh, and then the other big one, which we see the majority of the time in most of our brewing applications, are going to be centrifugal pumps. These are C series pumps, which we spend a lot of time talking about, the newer CD plus style, and we still see some Thompson pumps as well as a few, a few different ones. Um, what's the difference between PD and centrifugal? So when we look at PD pumps, these typically have an expanding cavity on the suction side and a, uh, a decreasing cavity on the discharge side, side to draw product in and then force it out. It's going to give you the same flow at a given speed, independent of your discharge pressure. You can't deadhead these pumps. If you pump against a closed orifice, um, James, you're back. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, That's okay. No issue. We all know you're busy. You're a working man. So uh, we don't hold it against you. Um, we're talking about PD pumps and centrifugal pumps. 
Uh, so I, uh, on the centrifugal side, we have uh, basically you have a, a rotating impeller and a stationary casing, and uh, that's going to kind of fling the beer at a very high speed. Uh, beer comes in the inlet and then it's forced out the outlet. They're really the workhorse of the pump. We see them all over the place, and they function on something called the affinity loss. So when you start thinking about sizing these pumps, sizing centrifugal pumps, you really need to understand what the affinity laws are. And basically what the affinity laws say, there's, there's a few different equations that you can see on the screen, I think, um, that talk about shaft speed and impeller diameter and head. But really in layman's terms, what this means is if we have more speed, if our motor runs faster, we're going to get more flow. If we have a bigger impeller, we're going to get more flow. We're also going to have more power consumption. Our motor is going to be bigger. And a bigger impeller allows us to overcome more head. So if we have more restriction downstream and we want to get more flow, then we need to increase our, uh, our impeller size, not just the speed. Uh, that, or, or motor horsepower. More motor horsepower does not mean more flow. I know uh, a lot of times James guys will call me and say they want, uh, they want a, a, a two-horse pump, thinking that's going to give them so much more flow. They want a C114, uh, and they want it to be a two-horse power because they're going to get more flow than their horse and a half. And if they don't have that bigger impeller, they don't have a, a, a three and three quarter or four inch impeller, they actually won't get more flow. If we, if we know those three factors, if we know uh, impeller size, if we know discharge head, and if we know what uh, our power consumption is, we can predict how these pumps are gonna perform, perform and we can size them accordingly. Um, so why is that really important? Again, we wanna be able to size these pumps using different curves. And, and if you've seen, ever seen a centrifugal pump curve, if you ever have any questions, it can be kind of confusing. But most of them look very similar and, and, and present the same sort of information. On the left-hand side, we see head and feet. Uh, across the x-axis here, we have U.S. gallons per minute. And if we come down here, we can see uh, what our, uh, our suction requirement is. Centrifugal pumps don't self-prime. You have to get fluid to the end. So uh, we, we, we need to be cognizant of what the net positive suction head required is. If we look at the different lines here, we can see our different curves at different impeller sizes. This is a C114 curve, which is by far and away by at least the most common uh, size C-series IC in breweries. And uh, you have eight going all the way down from two and a half all the way up to a four inch full size impeller. And then what your power draw is gonna be at different discharge heads as well as what your flows are. So if you were to tell me, Andy, I, I, want, I have a, a, a C114 with a three inch impeller, uh, or I'm sorry, a three and a quarter inch impeller, and I have 30 feet of discharge head, we can calculate that by what you're pumping against or how much friction loss you have, then I can predict how much flow you're gonna get and, uh, and what size horsepower motor you're gonna need. And at 30 feet ahead, I can see that we're gonna have a flow rate of about 75 gallons a minute. And my power consumption is gonna be over one horsepower, but under a horse and a half. So if I was sizing the motor, I'd select a horse and a half impeller. James, where, uh, well, I mean, I can tell you about the applications, but where do you use centrifugal pumps in your brewery? These are some examples, but where else? When, when, when do you see them? I mean, it's uh, that's primarily the only style pump that I'm currently uh, working with. Um, now, um, well, uh, um, what else? In addition to that, um, This is really it, right? It, it's it's a, your one-stop shop. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. How many, pumps a, do you, how many pumps do you have on your system? Um, I have three pumps. Uh, oh. What does the first pump do? So the first pump is just my hot liquor pump. So that is just uh, pumping hot water to my brew house. Um, and that's, yeah, pretty basic. Um, pretty basic, uh, yeah centrifugal pump uh then i have a uh, mash pump um i have a combination mash louder uh brew house and, and so like i'm not transferring mash from a mash mixer to uh, to like a louder time i'm just transferring uh, my liquid wort from the louder to the kettle so i don't there's no need for like flex and color pump or anything so that's a that's a standard um, centrifugal as well. And then uh, my, my boil kettle, uh, that's got 
um, a third centrifugal pump, and that's going to be uh, handling my CIP for the brew house, uh, my whirlpooling of the wort after uh, boiling, and then the transfer of the wort from the kettle to the fermenter. Uh, do you do any uh, dry hopping? Um, I do. Uh, I just don't have uh, a pump for that. <laughs> uh, that. That is all manually just dropped in um, from the top at the top of the tank. So. But there are some people, and if you had an unlimited budget, which uh, unfortunately I, I don't think we do, we, we all have budgets that we operate in. You know, sometimes we do see people use some tropical pumps to do uh, hop induction, right? Yes. Yep. And um, most of those have a um, the, the grinder impeller um, yeah. or the shear impeller um, to, to help break up those hop pellets um, as they're being uh, injected into uh, the, the beer at that point. Yeah. What is what is dry hopping, James? So that that's something that we that you see a lot now on cans. You see cans that are you know DDH double dry hopped or triple dry hopped, right? What does dry hopping do for the beer? So dry hopping is where we're gonna uh, extract the maximum amount of hop flavor uh, and aroma without imparting uh, bitterness. Uh, we we traditionally boil hops. Uh, to convert the, the alpha acid within the hops uh, into an assomerized um, uh, version, which then um, translates to bitterness. So uh, these days, the, the focus on of uh, most IPAs is just more flavor, more aroma, less bitterness. So um, the, the only real good way of doing that through dry hopping. Um, we use multiple um, dry hops uh, to, again, kind of control um, some of the, the flavor profiles. So our first dry hop is uh, during the, the primary fermentation, and that is, um, that's gonna give us more flavors um, and kind of like a, uh, more of the more of the juice um, and the, the last dry hop at the end of fermentation that's going to give us more of that that punchy aroma um, and you know some of the little green hop flavor that kind of mellows out over time but uh um yeah that, that's kind of like the, the the logic behind like a, a double dry hop um, Got it. So when they say like, yeah, okay, and, and when they say a beer is green, that's really what you're tasting is that second dry hop that sort of mellows over time. Yeah, so if it's really green, you, you get what we call a, uh, a hop burn, and um, it's, it's actual particles of the hop pellets still in suspension, and um, yeah, they're, they're, they're still pretty bitter. So even though we're not extracting bitterness, the, the particles themselves are pretty bitter. Uh, you do not want to eat a, a hop cone by itself. Um, so, you know, as long as we give it uh, proper uh, conditioning time, and usually mm -hmm. about a week, um, those hops will settle out. And, um, you know, we get a much more flavorful beer without the burn. Very good. Uh, we did have one question from the from uh, a chief who's who's watching who's joining us today. He asked, uh, "What pumps is it an issue to run dry, and what are the consequences of running dry?" So off the top of my head, some of the pumps that we see issues with running dry, centrifugal pumps for sure. And I think that happens a lot in some of these craft brew systems. And people will toast their seals basically. You'll you'll wreck the mechanical seal. PD yep. pumps, really any pump with a mechanical seal, you're going to have an issue running dry. Pumps that are okay to run dry tend to be like diaphragm pumps. Uh, air operated double diaphragm, which we'll talk about in a little while, as well as um, uh, there's a pump called the Quattro Tech. We, we talked about the Quattro Flow last week. It's a coordinary uh, pump that has uh, four diaphragms, very similar. But um, other than that, as a general practice, you don't want to run these pumps dry. Um, and what we mean by run dry, 
is prolonged dry running at full speed. It's, it's okay to bump the pump without any fluid on it just to check shaft rotation. You're not going to wreck your seal doing that, right, James? Uh, but it, it, if you're running for a prolonged period of time with no flow or very low flow, then, uh, then there's a very high likelihood that you're going you're gonna to post that seal and it becomes very obvious when you look at it. And um, I can't tell you how many times, and I'm sure James, you've seen the same thing when, you, when you're doing these brewery startups. Somebody will, um, will tell you, you'll ask them, well, did you run it dry? And they'll say, oh no, absolutely not. And then you'll go out and you'll look at the seal and sure enough, the thing is ground almost flat and um, there's no sealing face left and you go, you're sure? And then they're not so sure. So, so that's what we see. And if anytime you have a bad mechanical seal, you're gonna get two things. You're gonna get leakage and you're gonna get oxygen pickup. Uh, both of those things are really, really bad as a brewer. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Um, so again, when we look at centripetals, getting back to centripetals, talking about the workhorse of the brewery, um, the things to remember, you can't run these things dry, you can't self dry. Uh, they require adequate suction head, uh, which means that you want a bigger inlet than a discharge. You're never gonna see, don't call me and tell me you want to pump with a one inch inlet and a two inch outlet. You're never gonna see that. James? Can I, add, yeah, and also um, there's a lot of equipment out there and in setups where people are putting um, uh, T's or valves um, or really sharp elbows right in front of the, the inlet of that pump. And that's just causing um, turbulence, uh, which is gonna lead to cavitation. Um, those pumps, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you need like five times the, the diameter length um as your your inlet yeah that's 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 the best practice for sure yeah um and you know I, I i i see it a lot on like especially like cip cards um mm -hmm. you, know, you got these this this manifold going right into a pump and you know people like complain like hey this pump is just it's noisy uh it's not you know it takes forever to, to prime it it loses its prime, and what's going on is it's just there's too much turbulence going into that impeller, and um, we really need a laminar flow to add a, to to pump accordingly to its chart. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. A absolutely. I mean, I would say suction issues are without a doubt one of the biggest hangups. One of the things you can do with some triple pumps that is nice. Is you can deadhead them. You can pump them against a closed valve, right? You're not going to blow anything up. That's perfectly fine. If if you're getting too much flow, you can slow down your VFD or you can close the discharge valve. Either way, you're going to be able to throttle that pump right back. Um, other things to think about: um, how you clean it or how, what you want to accomplish when you clean will probably impact your uh, model selection. Um, but regardless of what you pick or what you use, um, regular maintenance is going to be really, really important for a consistent performance. Um, when we look at sort of the commercial landscape, what we see um, what we see in the market, there are really five kind of main manufacturers, maybe James, you've seen a couple others, but we got Waukesha APB, they both fall under the SPX umbrella. The Chris Stan, which at least I don't see, especially on the smaller craft brew houses, maybe on some of your larger German type systems, you'll see some Chris Stan, but you don't, you don't see those nearly as often. Ampco is pretty, pretty popular. They, they've done a really good job of focusing on and targeting uh, the craft brew space. Uh, and then Alpha Laval, don't see that as much. And we do still see some Thompson pumps. I'm surprised, it's probably where I see Thompson most often. Um, and we'll see some people using Thompson. Um, in terms of models uh, and, and types of centrifugal pumps, the most common ones in the C series. Uh, we have seen a newer generation of C plus and CD plus pumps. Uh, that are very common and, and, and solve a lot of common problems. I know problems that James has had working on his brew houses. Um, some true close couple pumps and then liquid ring pumps for CIP. Again, those liquid ring CIP pumps are pumps that can self prime, but um, they still can run dry. They still need a liquid ring, but they can self prime. And, uh, and those are going to be more for CIP applications in larger brew houses. Looking at the C series pump, it's the oldest centrifugal pump we have in the industry. Uh, it was originally designed for the dairy industry. Uh, it uses an adapter and stub shaft to mount to a C-face type motor. So you need a C-face motor. You, you can't use a JM motor for, for, a, for a C-series pump. 
And um, uh, it's, it's a really, really simple pump. And what's important to remember is that dimensionally and from a parts standpoint, all manufacturers' pumps are interchangeable. So Waukesha's gonna have a C-series, Amco's gonna have a C-series. There's the old Alpha or Alpha of Al Tricover C-series pumps. Um, top line does them. There's a number of different people who do them. And you, you can interchange those parts. We try to be advised against it. Um, it. It's really important to know what you have. But um, dimensionally too, you can replace an Alpha with a Waukesha. You can pull your piece of junk Amco pump out and you can put in a, put in a good old Waukesha, right? Um, so you, you can uh, you can you can do that or vice versa. When we look at the different parts, it, it's really simple. We have um, we have uh, a casing, a guard, a casing gasket. Um, whoop, let's see what we got. Impeller, uh, a carbon seal, a cup, and O-ring, a stub shaft, uh, the adapter back plate, and the uh, and clamp. So it's um, they're they're very very simple. Uh, just a couple of closer pictures of, of the different parts, stub shaft, deflector, uh, impeller, carbon seal, cup, seal o-ring, impeller, pin, uh, spring, and drive collar. Um, all right, talking about my favorite part of the, of the um, C-series pump, the wobble pin. So to hold our impeller onto the shaft, the stub shaft, we use what's called a wobble pin. Basically what you do is you center that pin in the middle of the shaft, you slide your impeller on, you give it a little turn, and that engages the pin. James, what's the issue with that? What problems have you seen using a wobble pin over the years? So if, uh, if that spring tension isn't um, compressed uh, far enough, or the, like the, what is it, the, the shaft adapter that compresses the spring, if that isn't set um, properly, or if it loosens mm -hmm. up, uh, when that pump sits idle, the wobble pin can fall out, and what it, and then it allows the impeller to pop off the shaft, and then you're all jammed up. Um, yeah. So that's uh, actually what does it. You know, I, I've wondered that a really long time. You used to call me and say, "Oh, the impeller pin fell out," and I'm like, "Well, how the heck did that have happened, right?" But that's what it is. Then the, the, they don't set the drive collar right. They change their seal. And then that causes the, the impeller to shift back just a little, right, on the subject oh, or forward. That's a and tiny you pin. don't have nice tension on it, right? And the pin will drop right out. That that explains it, right? See, Huber and I learned something in this webinar. That's, uh, that's interesting. You're welcome. Um, thank you. Uh, so when we look at the different kinds of seals, uh, or what we see in the c series, you know, we got our wobble pin, but we have three different seal configurations. Your D. Uh, which is your standard external, a DG, which is a true mechanical seal, and then an E-type series, which uses a stepping box and flush. We can hit a huge flow range with the C-series, 20 to 900 gallons a minute. Uh, looking a little bit closer at each different seal type, uh, we have the type D external seal, uh, most common, again, well suited for multiple applications, uh, really long service life. This is the most common seal type we see it, it, on craft beer pumps. Uh, we have our DG series. Uh, which uses a, basically instead of having a carbon on a stainless steel back plate, we have a ceramic insert that we run on. Uh, ceramic versus carbon is more desirable. That will give you a longer run time. It's good for high temperature applications or other abrasive things. If you're pumping, you know, if you're pumping wort, which is basically sugar water, right? Hot sugar water. Um, uh, that's going to be abrasive and that can wear on these seals. So we look at some different configurations for that. Um, and then this type East, East pump, uh, a lot of times we're, we're moving around boiling fluids and these seal faces get very, very hot. The carbon seals can almost actually melt. And if we're not dissipating that heat effectively, we're gonna help your pump squealing. James, how do, you, how do you know if your pump seal is getting too warm? Oh, she squeals. Uh, you'll, you'll hear it across a brewery. It's, um, it's a loud shrieking noise that uh, makes you wanna just smash the pump. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's unmistakable. Unmistakable. Um, so when you look at the pros of the C-Series, they're simple, they're cheap, they're cost effective. Uh, they do have this older wobble pin type seal. I think it's a pro, James, James thinks it's a kind of seal under both categories. Easy to maintain, really simple pumps. The hardest part, honestly, of servicing one of these pumps is getting under the brew house. If you can pull it out and work on it on the bench, Disconnect the conduit. Uh, I'm actually, James, I'm a little surprised the more that I think about it that guys 
use uh, don't use like quick disconnects on some of these pumps or disconnect uh, cables to bring power to these pumps. Because servicing them under the brew house, I mean, we saw the picture of you working under it, and uh, those are some tight spaces you got to get in. Yeah. Um, so, you know, with the the external seals, you know, those are a little easier to to work on. Yeah, you know, when you're underneath the brew house. Um, you know, when you get into that uh, internal seal, um, it, it's yeah, it's a little problematic. Um, and I mean, that's a good point about the quick disconnects. Um, oh, oh. It, it can be difficult because you're bringing a lot of power, right? And generally, when we use quick disconnect, it's low voltage stuff. You can use uh, you can use some, but uh, at the end of the day, you still have to unbolt it from the skid, right? Which is, right. Which is Right, and, so. Yeah, and mess with all your process piping, which yeah. hopefully is properly aligned, but oftentimes something's off and mm -hmm. fighting it. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, it's it's definitely better to, at least I found, to change these seals out when nobody's watching and when you're not under a time frame. <laughs> uh, right. You know what? I, I had that uh, just the other week with uh, a neighboring brewery. Is uh, uh, I was working on their pump seal and um, they, yeah, they're hovering over my shoulder and you do not want to make a mistake uh, when someone's looking at you. No, that's, that's, that's never a good thing. <laughs> it's not, no. You know, and, and, and yeah, it, it's so much easier to do these things in, in a perfect world, but when they're sticky and there's crap all over them because nobody's been cleaning them and you're trying to bang the stub shaft off, it, it's, it can be really difficult. So one of the things that they've actually gone to, a newer style of C-series pump, is what they call the C-plus and the C-B-plus pump. And this is a newer style of pump. It uses a threaded stub, stub shaft instead of our wobble pin. So we have, a, we have an acorn nut that will secure it. Uh, volumetrically and, and dimensionally, it's exactly the same as the C. And it has our same seal configurations, plus this great internal seal option, which a lot of people have used. Uh, the CB Plus series, which we offer on SPX pumps and is also marketed by Anco under their CB line, uses a Type 21 giant crane industrial seal. And basically, inside the pump, we have a ceramic seal face and a silicon carbide seal. And this puts the seal in the product zone. This can be good or bad, depending how you look at it. One of the pros to it, though, is that you can use the product as a flush. This is great for really hot, really sticky, abrasive products where we're not able to bring an external flush to the carbon seal. It's a great way to dissipate heat, keep things a little bit cooler. They usually use these on brew kettle pump out, is that right, James? That's still accurate? Yeah, yeah that's, that's the best place for it. Um, it's, it's not the best for uh, CIP applications just because of all the internal components. But uh, yeah. yeah, for that, for that hot work, it's, it's, it's quiet, it's, it's yeah. nice. That's it, yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit about the pros. There are a lot of pros. It's easy, you know, captive nuts nice. It's simple. People get it. You thread something on and that's it. Um, you have this internal seal uh, option. Uh, you do, there is a torque spec. You're supposed to torque it to a certain specification. As James mentioned, it's a little bit more service to more, a little more difficult to service under a, a system. Uh, there is a large sump in the back. Uh, basically, it's a recessed back plate where you can have product accumulate or anything kind of accumulate and grow. Because it's an internal seal, if it fails, and like any moving part, it eventually will, you kind of got to wonder where it goes. Uh, I don't think you want a beer that's got a piece of uh, silicon carbide floating in it. I don't think that does a whole lot for the flavor. Um, it's a little bit more expensive to change the seal out as well. And uh, availability is pretty good. That's not really as big of a concern as it used to be. Uh, really, the takeaways, though, from the C and the C+, plus, um, you got to know your equipment. Know your suppliers, work with good pump houses, work with good brew house manufacturers like Alpha Brewing. Um, repairs should be quick and easy, right? Uh, it shouldn't take more than a half hour across more than 100 bucks. If it does, you're probably doing something wrong. You should call somebody like me or like James. One of the things that I really respect and admire about the craft brewers and the craft brew industry is how eager people are to help one another. Uh, James, you know, James said, actually, this was in our run through that there aren't really any competitors, right? People help each other. And um, uh, so if you're, if you're having problems, you're, you're, you're getting a headache, uh, just um, just give somebody a call, reach out. Um, what else do we see in the centrifugal pump landscape? We see some pharmaceutical type pumps. These are close coupled pumps uh, where they you couple directly to the motor shaft. There is no stub shaft. 
There are forced options. Again, we don't see these too often in the, in the, in the brewery type industry. They tend to be more efficient, but they are more expensive. The examples of these are the Waksha 200 series, or S200 series, Anto LC, LF, and LP, and the first stand FPR and FPRs. Um, we talked a little bit about um, uh, liquid ring pumps and where those are used. Uh, typically, a liquid ring pump is going to be used in a CIP return type application. Um, you can air lock a centrifugal pump. So if you're getting products with a lot of entrained air, you can actually lock that centrifugal pump up. And uh, to get around that, we use a, a, a liquid ring pump uh, for CIP return. Have you ever seen one of those used in the brewery, James, a, a liquid ring? No. Mm -hmm. I, I think some of the bigger guys do. It's not really craft brew. It would be more like the, um, the macro brewers that, that, that um, would be using liquid ring pumps. So it's important to be aware of, but it doesn't come up too often. Um, when we look at now getting away from some tropicals and into positive displacements, uh, these are common. We do see these in a few different places. We'll talk a little bit about uh, what they are and, and the different applications. Uh, a PD pump, and I promise we're going to get to the patients and that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, PD pumps, uh, the defining features, they, as I mentioned earlier, they displace a given volume at a certain speed regardless of the discharge pressure. So with a centrifugal pump, if my discharge head goes up, I get less flow. With a PD pump, that thing just keeps going, right? It's going to create greater suction on the inlet, especially some miles, but you can't deadhead these with the exception of an air operated double diaphragm. And we're going to control our speed, not with discharge head, but with a variable frequency drive. You can control a centrifugal with a variable frequency drive, but it's not as common. Um, well, I shouldn't say not as common. It's actually very common, but um, it, it's not uh, maybe as, as necessary. So look at our first type of PD pump. This is probably the most common one that I see in the brewery. Um, uh, air operated double diaphragm pumps. We use these a lot to feed um, counter pressure fillers that have high discharge heads and reasonably low flows where we need to pump into that hole. James, you have an air operator. You have a little Graco Santa Force 515, right? I do. Um, I use it for. Who use that for? Um, uh, well, I, early on, I was using it to transfer uh, cold brew coffee uh, uh -huh. from uh, our our mash tun, if you will, uh, to our bright tank. Uh, but I've used them in the past from uh, when the bright tank is, uh, you know, a fair distance away from like the canning line or the bottling line. Um, it's a great pump uh, to move product because that product isn't going to uh, come in contact with um, any oxygen. Uh, it's, it's gentle on the product, so you're not shearing it. Um, you know, it's not going to beat the carbonation out and, um, uh, um, uh, but I currently use the, uh, so my glycol chiller is up, up on our roof and every once in a while the glycol needs to be topped off. And because it's a self priming pump, uh, yeah. I use that, that pump to, uh, draw fresh glycol out of our drum and pump it up to the roof. And, um, it, it's a great pump. Uh, it's also got like a built-in check valve, so you don't have to worry about, um, you know, pr uh, like the glycol flowing back at you just because, okay. you know, but, um, yeah, it's, um, uh, it's a, it's a great style pump. I'm, I'm fortunate to have one and, um, uh, yeah, anytime I can, anytime I have to pump finished product, that's the best pump for it. One of the, and we talked about it a little bit, one of the biggest enemies to beer is oxygen. And with an air operated double diaphragm, even though it runs on air, um, there's no mechanical seal. So if everything's put together right, and you're, it's, it's functioning properly, you're not going to have any O2 pickup, which is really important. It's really low shear, CIP of all, as James mentioned, you can self prime. It uses air. Uh, you get a great bang for your buck in terms of PD pump, um, on the PD pump space. You can hit the higher discharge heads, you can hit the higher discharge pressures. You can use air, which most breweries have. It's, it's pretty available, compressed air. It's expensive to generate versus electricity, but um, uh, it, it's available and it, you just, it's a very much plug and play. You can control your speed by, uh, by turning the, your regulator up or down. Um, it does use compressed air, as I mentioned, that's expensive. They can, they can pulse it, right? So they knock quite a bit. Uh, they're noisy, they're loud. You'll know when it's running, right? Um, and uh, it'll it, it, so a lot of the ones we see in the brewery struggle with high solids. They do have some high solid models available. Diaphragms can rupture and be replaced. 
low temperatures, we see some we see seen some issues with uh, temp with uh, 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 creep, seal creep, and um, uh, but overall, it's it, they're great pumps to have, and we, we do see them quite a bit in the breweries. Um, we also do see ECP or uh, rotary weld type pumps. Um, these uh, move fluid uh, by rotors at creating, expanding, and, and, and collapsing cavity on the inlet and the discharge. Uh, it draws fluid in, and then the collapsing cavity uh, uh, forces product out. The rotary low pump is probably the pump I saw most often in a number of different applications, and we do see them in breweries. You see, you've seen uh, rotary loads in breweries before, James, right? The ones with a budget, yeah. yeah. Um, Use them for. Uh, <laughs> they're uh, they're great for um, moving like slurries, like um, in uh, syrups and um, uh, you know uh, we use like a lot you, of like extracts. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. You know, yeah. It's great for dosing, um, mm -hmm. and so anything with that's you know got high viscosity. It's um, it's. It's a great pump to, to use. Again, it's self-priming, so uh, you don't have to worry about trying to move sludge um, to the pump. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, um, I don't know if anyone's using it for spent grain, but uh, I feel like that would be a fairly decent application for it too. Yeah, and we'll get to the spent grain in a minute, but um, uh, I, 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 that is, it's an, it's an okay application for spent grain. Uh, it's probably, they, they do have some rectangular flange models that allow you to kind of get it underneath uh, a tank and, and get the spent grain into it. Um, uh, so it would work there, but I, I think there are some other options that we can do it. We'll actually talk about that in the next slide. The other kinds that we see are, they're more expensive. Usually a, a rotary weld assembly with a pump, a gear motor, and a base is going to be in the $10,000 range. For a lot of craft brewers, that's just you know, not something that they can, that, that they're going to want to spend, right? So we really need to think about that. Um, you can't deadhead them, they're going to blow something up, right? And you can't run them dry. One other thing, and, and I, I, you know, I don't think we have too many other craft brewers, but I do want to get my uh, PSA in right now. Uh, it's a crazy world right now with all the coronavirus stuff going on, and we appreciate all the craft brewers out there for making hand sanitizer and, and doing all these different things. But you really need to think about it uh, because I had a guy, a craft brewer, who called me and he, he was wondering if he could handle uh, glycerin with his uh, centrifugal pump, right? And uh, they, they use the glycerin as a thickening agent for, um, uh, uh, for, uh, for, for these hand sanitizers, right? And on top of that, the pump is 80% ethanol, right? Most beers are in the what? What would you say, Jim? Five and a half to 10% at the absolute most, ABV? <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, that's, that's a common um, uh, percentage. I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, I, you know, I, I told him, I said, yeah, your centrifugal pump could probably handle this heavier glycerin product. It was about 500 centipoise. But you're, I know what you're using, and you're not using an explosion proof motor. And he goes, well, no, I'm not. And I said, well, you're pumping 80% ethanol. I go, that's not good, right? So you want to be thinking about everything. And, of course, he goes, well, I already bought all the ingredients, right? And I just told him, I said, well, I, you know, I, I think the least of your concern is uh, um, uh, what, whether or not your triple pump can handle it. You need to think more about uh, while you're, you know, you're going to blow yourself up. But um, uh, we do appreciate all the craft brewers and everybody out there who's doing what they can to pitch in. James is a former EMT. My wife is a, is an ICU nurse, so. Uh, they need that stuff right now. We do appreciate everything you guys are doing, but think about it. Think about it before you just go out and do it. Because um, with any of these pumps, you need to make sure that they're applied properly. Otherwise, you potentially have some issues and cause harm to yourself or, or some others. Um, the other pumps that we do see, uh, again, less common in small breweries, more common in big breweries, are twin screw type pumps. Uh, these have interlocking screws that move product around, uh, along an axial uh, 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 path. Uh, you can run these uh, at high speeds uh, and use it as a product pump as well as a CIP pump. Uh, they're self-priming, uh, great for powder induction and whole hop handling. So we talk about like dry hopping and, and whole cone integrity. Um, you, can, you can basically fit a whole hop cone uh, inside each of the cavities of the, of the twin screw pump and that's uh, 
that's desirable. Good for dosing, metering, but again, very, very expensive, high maintenance cost, large footprint. Um, probably not something you're going to see in a craft brew house, but if you're going to see, you know, Miller or Miller Coors or Anheuser Busch, they might have a happy first brew or something like that. Um, other pumps that we do see from time to time that have a really nice uh, spot is the Quattrotech line of pumps. These are four diaphragm pumps, ultra smooth. Uh, there's no mechanical seal, so we're not going to have any O2 pickup. Uh, great for um, uh, uh, clean, thin fluids. You can't pump higher viscosity fluids with them. You can run these things dry. They're cost effective and they hit lower flow rates, most importantly. So, if we want to do a dosing or a metering application, pumping in very small amounts of, of product, uh, that's a good uh, PD pump option, uh, especially a sanitary one. Talking a little bit about spent grain, this is where we look at progressive cavity, and that, that's probably the most uh, uh, progressive cavity type pump, a Nesh or a, what's it, a Lua? Lua, I think, has progressive cavity. There, there are a few other brands out there. The one that we sell is Nesh. And um, uh, these are really good for handling thick, dry product when you're pumping out spent grain. James, can you tell us what spent grain is? What, what that, why that's, um, uh, 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 what, what, why we need to get rid of our spent grain? Uh, well, the spent grain is the left leftover husk material um, from our malted barley that we use to uh, extract the sugar from. Um, but that, that spent grain, it's, it's still uh, coated in uh, lactobacillus, which is a, a bacteria, a, a souring bacteria. And um, well, we, we need to get rid of it out of the brew house in a timely manner, because um, it's, it's gonna start rotting. Um, and, uh, and also it just holds up production. So uh, the faster we can get it out of the brew house, and, uh, but it's heavy, it's wet, it's heavy. Uh, it's not fun to to rake out of a, a mash tun, so uh, I, would, I would love a pump. Um, As you say, uh, how do you do it now? Yeah, uh, I got a tippy dump uh, dumpster that, uh, so I just shovel all the spent grain into this tippy dump, and then uh, unfortunately being in the city, I have to throw away uh, all my spent grain into um, dumpsters. Uh, and that gets hauled away to a landfill. It's a little unfortunate. Um, what do so, a lot of people do with it? Well, uh, it's it's a great um, source of fiber for um, like cow farms, and um, you know it's a great chicken feed supplement. Um, mm -hmm. You know, some people will will bake with it, but not the quantities that we're we're working with. Um, you know, on my 15 barrel system, I'm dealing with uh, one to two yards worth of um, spent grain uh, at the end of the day. So that's, that's a lot of uh, grain to be trying to bake with. Um, yep. Yep. Well, I don't know, I guess that's uh, outside of paper towels, that's the new like commodity that everyone needs to have. They all want paint and, and baking goods because people are just staying home and, and, and baking. Mm. Is, uh, sourdough is the new hot thing. The sourdough, yeah, I got a lot of Instagram sourdough posts, but uh, anyway, where do we see uh, brewery pumps or PD pumps in the brewery? Hot liquor, work transfer applications, counter pressure filling, and canning lines. Uh, that's that's another place where we see a lot of uh, PD pumps air operated, air operated double diaphragm specifically, and then spent grain removal. Um, so given all this, how do you know which one to choose? When do I use a PO, uh, what pump do I choose? When do I use a PD pump? When do I use a centrifugal? You want to be thinking about things like product viscosity, particle size and integrity, shear sensitivity, flow rate, pressure, accuracy. Uh, how consistent does the pump need to be? Are you dosing and flavoring? Do you need to repeat that? Well, one batch have too much cherry, another batch have not enough cherry. Um, how sensitive is the, is the product and the process to the oxygen? Uh, what power do you have available? If you don't have uh, uh, enough amperage coming into your building, you can't run some of these pumps, right? So you want to be cognizant of that and then how you're going to control it as well. Uh, we do have kind of a, a guide of, 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 of we go through this and, and as you can kind of see, look at your product, think about your product, it's greater than 500 cent of uh, you're probably going to be in a PD, no, uh, if you have particles in it, uh, no, then you're still in the centrifugal pattern. Use something like this to kind of make a good educated decision of what you need.
Um, with that, uh, we're through the presentation. I'll open it up for any questions that anybody has. Um, and we'll switch over cameras here. Uh, we have uh, uh, some more production value here. We'll get to the tasting, the moment of truth for, for James. So let me stop this. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. But I'm going to um, uh, change over my video right now. And uh, can I get James, or not James, Kevin and uh, Bill in? Uh, let's see what we got here. Choose virtual background. I want to turn that off. So now you can see the room that I'm in. And uh, it's not as glamorous as maybe the CIP skid look. But we're going to get we're going to get some guys and we're going to do a tasting here. You guys ready? Kevin? Taste test time. All right. James, can you see me? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we got five beers here. The first one is Second City Wave. Do you want to tell us about Second City? Uh, it's kind of like your traditional West Coast IPA. So it's got um, a little bit of a, a, a malty. Uh, uh, no, I got no cup. Keep going. James? Uh, yeah. Oh. See. All right. The phone's ringing. Uh oh. Yeah, at, at uh, 4 o'clock on Good Friday, probably not a good sign. So, so, the, so we said the, the uh, Windy City or the second city is, your, is our West Coast IPA. The second beer, beer two, is Schwarzweather. What's Schwarzweather, James? Uh, that is a black lager. So, um, I guess the closest thing I would compare it to is uh, a porter. Uh, brewed as a lager, and uh, so it gives you a nice clean uh, finish. And um, yeah. All right. How about uh, let our our third beer here is going to be the Hazy River, which is one of my favorites. Hazy River is a you know New England IPA. Um, it's, uh, make sure we socially distance. Oh yeah. Back up, guys. Um, yeah. So it's got you know your your classic. You know, Citra, Mosaic, uh, Little Ido 7, uh, so it's got a little bit of a tropical note, and some, uh, but it's mostly citrusy. Then uh, our fourth beer here is the Goat. Okay. Um, it's, uh, it's a German style Doppelbach, so it's a uh, big old malty um, amber lager. Uh, actually, uh, Traditionally consumed uh, this time of the year uh, during Lent um, by the monks. Really? Why is that? Because uh, they have to fast, and you know you still got to eat. So uh, <laughs> that that beer has got enough calories to hold you over. I assure you. And then uh, our last one is actually a non-urban renewal. Uh, mm -hmm. This is Ninja versus Unicorn, and. Uh, uh, that was a, Ninja versus Unicorns from Pipeworks, another really popular Chicago brewery. One of the first double IPAs I ever had. I think it's about eight percent ABV. Yeah, oh look at that, guess it right on the nose. And uh, we'll see. So we got one through five. <coughs> I would encourage you boys to try one of each, and then I want to <coughs> see if you guys want to rank them. Uh, one through five. Hey, Andy. Yeah. I gotta break Kevin's heart. Oh, we just yeah. we just sold out of the packy. Oh man. Sorry, man. Okay, I need I need you to send us some gear then. You know, <laughs> t-shirts, hats, something like that. I would be great. Care package. All right, yeah, Kevin. care packages are good. Why don't Why don't you start? start oh, really? Start whatever one. Yeah. Tell us what you think. Um, Second City Waves. You who's your row? Who's Who's drinking? It's Does you, me and Bill. Yeah, it's, it's you and Bill. Bill. I'm just yeah. picking on one up. Okay. Second City Waves. Kind of bland and dry for flavor. Okay. Bland and dry. I, I, I actually, so West Coast IPAs are going to be a little bit more bitter, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to have a real kind of hoppy, piney flavor to them. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one is going to be Schwarzweather. I guess, Bill, what did you think of Second City Waves? 
Um, I think I'll describe him as well as Kevin. He's a little more beer snob than me, but uh, I understand where you're talking about a little more bitterness on it. Not uh, not quite my cup of tea, but we'll see how the see how the line goes. Let's get into the we'll get into the dark lager now. This is kind of like a, tastes like a coffee. Very roasty, lots of malt, right? In the, yeah. in the, in the black lager. I had the, it's not, it seems like it wants to be a Guinness, but it's not quite there yet. So, so what's the difference, James, between like a like a Guinness, a stout, and uh, in a black type lager? Uh, well, uh, for a stout, you tr traditionally use uh, roasted barley, so that's a uh, it's a heavily roasted, um, unmalted uh, grain. So that's going to impart like that that astringent. Um, coffee bitterness um, and in our black lager we used um, a lot of chocolate malts uh, which are roasted as well just not to the same degree as roasted barley um, so it, it still lends a little bit of a, uh, like a dark chocolate sweetness okay third one is going to be hazy oh, river Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is the one I had. I had the hazy river. I thought it was really good. Yeah, doing my power rankings as I go. I'm on to the hazies these days. That's Are really you? Good. Oh, good for you. Everyone likes a good hazy double, right? I tell James that all the time. Very expensive to make, though. Low margin. <laughs> all right. You can just use the can. Now we're going to number four, which is the Doppelbach. <laughs> What do you get on the nose, Kevin? I feel like dark fruit and like raisin. Yeah, yeah. Dark right. fruit, right? Raisin, yeah. Now, are you gonna barrel age this, James? Uh, half that batch is barrel aged. It's sitting in um, apple brandy. It's different, yeah. So he's got half the batch sitting in apple brandy barrels right now. That actually, that sounds good. Yeah. I would drink this. I would yeah. say this is one A. I would say to the yeah. hazy. One A. Well, everyone and everyone likes the hazy. So I have a I have a lager, right? That is um, that that people really like. I actually had the goat with a steak uh, a couple weeks ago. I sent James a picture of it, um, and that that went really well together. One of the things I struggle with with hazy IPAs is I can't get them a pair of food at all. Uh, but when you have lagers. Uh, Doppel box Pilsners. <clears throat> they, I, I just find the food much better. And finally, we have the Ninja versus Unicorn. Yeah, I just had one of these. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. I'm going to taste it. Is no one from Pipeworks on the call? Hopefully? Nobody from <laughs> Pipeworks is on the call. Yeah. But it is a, it is a Chicago staple. Yeah, <laughs> just, yeah. Can't just throw it away. Yeah. All right, so what do we got? One, two, three, four, five. Um, so I got. Let's go, Bill, first. Bill, you go first. I got the, the Hazy River one, Goat two, the Black Lager third, the City Waves fourth, and then uh, Ninja versus Unicorn last. Kevin? I got a tie. Uh -huh. I got a tie with the Goat and Second City, Second City Waves. I'm very impressed with those two. Uh -huh. uh, I like Stout, so. That's number two, definitely number two. And this hazy, I'm, we're not going to be friends. And that can just go in the garbage. <laughs> there you go. So there we have it. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us. We're going to enjoy Holland here. We're going to wrap up the rest of the day, enjoy the rest of our happy hour. Hopefully, we're going to have to thump too. Um, we appreciate everyone joining us. And uh, James, thank you very much. Get out and support your local craft breweries yeah. more important now than ever. And uh, do you want to go ahead and give yourself a plug? Second City Waves. It's not overpowered. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, enjoy your weekend. Uh, waiting on my care it. package. Have a happy Easter. Take it easy, guys. Thanks for everything. Um, we'll hopefully really see you next week for another happy hour. Thank Thanks you. again. Thank you. Yeah. Andy, Ike wants to know when he's going to be able to partake in one of these. Oh, we can get on. Uh, that goat was impressive. <laughs>